and thank you uh, State Lands for sponsoring this event and this session. Uh, my name is George Steinbach. Can you hear me okay in the back? Here? Okay. <clears throat> my voice isn't as strong as that. Um, um, I'm with uh, CARE, the California Artificial Reef Enhancement Program. We're a nonprofit organization that's been engaged in the reached reef issue for many, many, many years now, it seems. Um, and today I had the pleasure of giving you a summary and update on Rigs to Reef in the state of California. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the issue of Rigs to Reef is, is a very uh, complex and multifaceted issue. Uh, and there's a lot of aspects of it that I really have, do not have the time to cover. So I, my strategy today is to focus on what I think is important what you, what you uh, need to know most about Rigs to Reef. And then if there's any questions or any other question, uh, questions or, or you want to discuss things outside of my scope, then please bring it up in the Q&A. Um, the, um, the Rigs to Reef, uh, oh, the, uh, and my focus, to give you a tell on what my focus is today, um, uh, I think that the Rigs to Reef issue is not primarily an oil and gas issue. My background is oil and gas, and I come at this, uh, but I still come at this as a, at a little, with a little different perspective. Um, I think that the main importance and the benefits of Rigs Reef primarily fall within the um, areas of um, fisheries management. So that's gonna be, I'm gonna give you a, 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 some, quite a bit of information in that area. Let's start with some photos. This is a photo of Platform Hilda in the Santa Barbara Channel. It was installed in 1958 in about a little over 100 feet of water and was removed in 1996. Um, these photos were taken in the middle 1970s, 1975 or thereabouts as a part of the first, one of the first surveys and studies of the California offshore platforms by a marine biologist. The photographer was Bob Evans, he's a diver and obviously underwater photographer from Santa Barbara, and I want to thank Bob for allowing me to show this and a, a couple more pictures uh, of Platform Hilden. This is a picture of Hilda underwater uh, within the jacket. We're looking at a leg of the platform focusing, or looking up towards the surface, and you see the abundant fish life around the platform. Uh, these are rockfish. They're native. They're a group of native California rock uh, fish species that live on natural rocky reefs, but also are found in abundance on these platforms. The uh, the leg that we see in the picture is covered with invertebrate life, and at this depth, these are going to be sea anemones. This is another view of uh, platform Hilda from a different location. It's an interesting photograph because it's in a transition zone and we can see a lot of the different marine life here uh, that, that is in, that it's massive <coughs> and it's on different parts of the platform. <clears throat> the dark browns are mussels and sea scallops. The reds are sea anemones and the whites are called matridians. They're a, a different type of sea anemone that can grow up to a height of about three feet at the bottom of some of these structures. What you can't see because of the resolution of this photograph are all the other uh, animals that live around the mussel shells and the sea anemones. And they include sponges and brittle stars and shrimps and crabs. This is a picture of a, of a very vibrant marine habitat, literally teeming with different types of animal life. Uh, this is an, an interesting picture here. It's a fun picture. You have a diver in 1970s vintage scuba gear holding two starfish off the platform. Uh, these are actually called giant starfish, uh, but they are really enormous specimens. Uh, they're at least twice the size of anything else you'd find in the Santa Barbara Channel. And that's really a function of the very abundant marine life, uh, of the, the food source that they have on on the platform. Now, platform Hilda, oh, what, what we have to, rec uh, 
Um, Bob Evans has scores of other photos of Platform Hilda in his portfolio, and they all tell about the same story. They show a, a, a thriving and, and vibrant and quite beautiful marine habitat. But what we have to recognize that is this no longer exists. Platform Hilda was removed in 1996, <clears throat> and this habitat was destroyed. Uh, the fish that we saw around the platforms were affected by the decommissioning processes, and many of them died from the concussive effects of the explosives used to sever the piles. That was necessary to lift the platform off the seafloor. The invertebrate life, of course, is attached, attached to the legs and cross beams of the structure, and they died when the, when the platform was removed from the water. Uh, actually, the platform came ashore not far from here uh, in uh, Long Beach Shipyard. Uh, platform Hilda was one of four projects included in a, uh, all removed at the same time. The other platforms were uh, Hope, Heidi, and Hazel. And they were all about the same size and the same water depths, and all with this very similar habitats. Collectively, that was called the 4-H project. And it's the last decommissioning project of oil platforms of a structure that, is, that has occurred in California. <clears throat> um, the, the removal of the 4-H project was a seismic event for a, a lot of people that knew these structures well. Uh, specifically, there were sports fishermen who fished frequently around these structures and divers, of course, have seen this marine habitat firsthand. Um, they were uh, very distressed by both the results, which was the platform removal and the loss of this habitat, and, but they were also distressed with the process uh, that led up to this execution of the project. They, uh, several of them followed the permitting that went on <coughs> to, uh, to get approvals for the decommissioning process. And they found that the, the value of this habitat was not well understood at all and was not considered in any of the decisions regarding platform decommissioning. Um, additionally, the, um, um, the, they were told that the platform removal, or the total removal of the structure was the only option available for decommissioning. Um, this disappointment, this unhappiness with the process caused the um, sports fishermen and divers to organize themselves and begin an effort to, in their words, never let this happen again. Um, my organization, CARE, was founded in, in the wake of this uh, and, and as a part of their efforts. We were founded in 1998, two years after Hilda was removed. And we set about our, uh, we set ourselves some tasks to correct the issues associated, the problems we saw associated with the 4-H project. Uh, two specific ones were to um, better understand, first to better understand this habitat and the role it plays in the marine environment and be able to explain to others. And secondly, to create additional decommissioning options for regulators to use. As I, as I stand here today and look back, I think we have been largely, we have made significant progress on both of those items. One big milestone was the passage uh, of the California Marine Resources Legacy Act by the California legislature and its signing into law by the governor in 2010. This established a rigs to reef proof program for the state of California administered by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now this law does not directly authorize the reefing or partial removal of a platform anywhere offshore. What it does do is set up a process whereby the partial removal of a, uh, of a structure can be considered by the commission if certain conditions are met. 
And there are two primary conditions. There are many conditions in the law, but the two primary conditions are that compared to full removal, a, partial, a proposed partial removal of Riggs to Reef project has to demonstrate net environmental benefit and a substantial cost savings. Uh, with, re with respect to the cost savings, that is a, an important issue, particularly for the industry, but it's really secondary to the rig to Riggs to Reef, and I'm gonna defer that discussion to another day um, and focus this presentation primarily on net environmental benefit. To understand that environmental benefit, um, we have to rely on our scientific community for some answers. And um, there have been uh, surveys and studies done beginning in the 70s, in the, and there were surveys in the 80s and, the, and also in the in early 90s. But the first systematic set of surveys began in 1998, or around about that year, when Dr. Milton Love from UC Santa Barbara uh, received a grant, a federal grant of money from the U.S. Geologic Survey to begin surveying the California platforms. Um, he conducted these surveys annually in about 2010. So in his database, we have about a decade's worth of data for most of the California platforms. Uh, the data is available for anybody to review. It's available for any marine scientists to study, analyze, and write reports on. And that is actually what's been done. Many reports have been generated from this data, and I want to highlight just three of them to give you a, a sense of the progression of our uh, of this of our understanding of these uh, reefs of these uh, habitats. In 2003, they looked at five years worth of data, uh, and and compared the platforms to the natural rocky reef sites, and determined that the platforms had higher densities of fish and are more functionally important as fish nurseries than the natural reef sites. Additionally, they determined that the platforms acted as de facto marine refuges because they were either lightly fished or in many cases not fished at all. In 2006, a study focused on a specific um, species of rock fish known as the Boccaccio. This is a commercially important species in the state of California and it, at the time, was severely overfished. Uh, you, you become overfished if you're uh, obviously serious, seriously depleted and your uh, species in trouble. And there was a lot of focus at the time to determine the best ways to protect this species and to allow it to recover. Uh, they looked at the data and they found that most of the adult Boccaccio, at least in the Santa Barbara Channel, the adult Boccaccio of reproduction age in the San Bonja lived around the oil platforms and concluded that the platform habitats were very important in rebuilding these stocks. Finally, in 2014, um, this is the latest study of significance that's been published. They compared the California platform, two scientists from Oxdale College compared the uh, California platforms with, with habitat um, uh, marine habitat worldwide, uh, well-known habitats that were uh, on the basis of their fish productivity and concluded that the California platforms are the most productive fish habitats in the world. This is a pretty strong statement, so let's bore down a little bit into that. Um, I don't know how visible this is. Um, there's some numbers here. I apologize for that, but I'll uh, bear with me. I'm, I'm just going to use a couple of them. This is a table from their report, which was published in 2014 by the National Academy of Sciences publication. And it shows all the habitats that were compared. And they were compared on the basis of the standard measure of fish productivity that's used by marine, so marine biologists everywhere. It's called secondary fish production. And here it's shown, and the, the units are in grams of biomass, of fish biomass, per square meter per year that are produced on a given habitat. This is a list in descending order of secondary fish production, and you can see that the California platforms are right at the top. They have a range of secondary fish production from 104 to 887. Pretty wide range. But the second most productive habitat they found 
It was a coral reef off Morea, which is uh, in the South Pacific, about 10 miles from Tahiti. Its secondary fish production rate is 74. So that's uh, about a order of magnitude lower than what you find at the California platforms. You can go down the list and see the other habitats that were compared. There's estuaries, coastal lagoons, <clears throat> salt marsh, eelgrass beds, etc., all coming in lower than the, than the platforms. Uh, and these are all well-known and highly regarded fish producing site, fish habitat, fish producing habitats uh, everywhere. Uh, draw your attention to two more items. The second blue arrow is the deep rocky reef in California. That's the natural analog to these platforms. <clears throat> They're often at the same depth and have the same species. And their secondary pr fish production is in the range from four to 22. And that's one to two orders of magnitude lower than the California platforms. Finally, uh, the third blue arrow identifies the soft bottom California. And uh, that is the full removal option. If you decommission a structure and you remove it from the water, what you have left is soft bottom. And the secondary fish production there is six. This is the um, This is the uh, main argument, the scientific underpinning for the entire Riggs to Reef discussion. And regardless of how you see this data, whether you find it compelling or uh, convincing or something less, I think it vindicates the, the, the reactions of the sports fishermen and divers back when Platform Hildebrand was removed in 1996. And because of their stubbornness uh, and their pursuit of knowledge and truth about these structures, uh, I think we're, we're, we know much more about them and we also have more options to deal with them. So whatever happens in the future, um, it is, it's my belief that we are now in a position to make much better decisions regarding the final dispositions of these offshore structures and the very special and unique habitats that live there. Thank you.